Good evening. Welcome to all of you in the name of our Savior Jesus. Special thank you for being here in this ugly cold weather. Where better to warm up our hearts and minds and souls than here in God's house. So our order of service this evening is the service of light. It's printed for you in your service folder. Hope you print, uh, picked up one of these. It's green. It says December 30th on it. That'll be the right one for us this evening. Our theme of the day is Christ has come to reveal our salvation. So we'll be thinking especially about how did Christ reveal our salvation to us? Well, he reveals that our salvation comes through his own suffering, through his own work, and he reveals our salvation to us now through his word and sacraments. So again, where better for us to be than gathered here around God's word and sacraments as means of grace. If you've noticed, the order of service does not begin with an opening hymn. It begins with a dialogue for us. So let's begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. <laughs> Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening. Be our light and scatter the darkness. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, for you are merciful and you love your whole creation. We, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, in mercy you sent your one and only Son to take upon himself our human nature. By his gracious coming, deliver us from the corruption of our sin and transform us into the likeness of his glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson from God's Word for this evening comes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verses 20 through 25. Christ has come to reveal our salvation, just as God himself had promised from ages long past, just as he said he would. At Christmas, we remember that God fulfilled his word. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Gather together and come. Assemble, you fugitives from the nations. Ignorant are those who carry about idols of wood, who pray to gods that cannot save. Declare what is to be. Present it. Let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who declared it from the distant past? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a Savior, there is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn. My mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow. By me every tongue will swear. They will say of me, In the Lord alone are righteousness and strength. All who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. But in the Lord, all the descendants of Israel will be found righteous and will exult. This is the word of our Lord. Let's continue now with our psalm of the day. It's Psalm 111. It's printed there for you on page 6 in your service folder. Let's sing the psalm together. comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Christ has come to reveal our salvation, and the way he does that is through his word. 
Since that is the case, then Paul reminds us to use God's word and follow God's word faithfully for ourselves and our own lives and for the spiritual and eternal good of each other and all those around us. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of our Lord. Let's continue now to speak together the seasonal response that's printed there for you on page 7 in your service folder. Alleluia! We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Alleluia! Then out of respect for the words and works of our Lord, please stand for the gospel lesson. Today's gospel comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 40. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Let's continue now with our hymn of the day. It's hymn number 41. Let all together praise our God.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, a sword will pierce your own soul too. What mother would like to hear that about her firstborn child? The glory of the angels, the praise of the shepherds, the marvelous words that Simeon first spoke. Mary treasured all those things up in her heart. But then there was this. I wonder if Mary really fully understood what she heard right then, but I'm betting that she never forgot it. I mean, how could she with the way she witnessed herself Jesus dying? Mary was a believer too. She was a good Jewish girl who I'm sure knew her scriptures. And so no doubt that meant she knew what the prophecy said about what would have to happen to the Messiah. He would be arrested and beaten and crucified. But I wonder if Mary had really come to grips with that just then or if maybe this was the first time she gave that any real thought. That chilling prophecy is the last we hear of Simeon in the Bible. But his words actually bring into focus the true significance of Christmas. It is a time that brings joy, but only through grief. It is a time that brings peace, but only through pain. It is a time that brings love, but only through sacrifice. And it is a time when our salvation is revealed, but that salvation only comes by the sword, the sword that pierced Jesus first, and then also through the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. It was time for the consolation of Israel, how, how long they had waited. But doesn't that just seem like a really interesting way for the author to put it? It was time for the consolation of Israel. What what consolation was he meaning? He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, is what the author says. Well, lots of people probably thought in those days that the nation of Israel needed to be consoled after everything they had been through, even ever since the time of the kings. You see, everything was great during the time of King David and up until the temple was built, but that's when the wheels really started to come off. Solomon didn't follow the Lord, or at least followed him only half-heartedly. After he was gone, Israel split into north and south, and for the next 400 years, we can count on one hand the number of good kings who actually ruled over those kingdoms. Idol worship was rampant, which caused both of those kingdoms to eventually go off into exile, at least for a time. Now the Lord in his faithfulness, he brought back the southern kingdom to the promised land. But as the Persian Empire gave way to the Greeks, who gave way to the Romans, it seemed like every new people who ruled over Israel just beat them further and further down into the mud. Was that any way for the chosen people of God to be treated, his specially chosen people, his own precious possession. No, the consolation of Israel that many were waiting for was for God to turn the tide and make them the big dog on the block again. But that wasn't the kind of consolation that Simeon was waiting for. Simeon was righteous and devout, the text says, a true believer who, by the power of the Holy Spirit, had faith that followed through into his life. He wasn't waiting for some political victory or the second coming of some worldly kingdom. He knew that the Lord's kingdom is not of this world. And so the consolation of Israel that he was looking for was a consolation of the soul, not for the earthly nation of Israel, but for the true Israel of God, for 
all believers of all times and places, even for you and me, and he saw it right there coming into the temple when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus that day. But at what price would this consolation come? Well, Simeon said to Mary, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Jesus once said that he didn't come to bring peace, but the sword. He came to divide believers from unbelievers, righteous from unrighteous, selfless from selfish, he would cause the falling of many in Israel who thought much too highly of themselves and their own good works, whose whole standing before God was just a house of cards. But he would cause the rising of many in Israel whose repentance put them on their knees before God asking for forgiveness and through faith in him he would raise them up to new life and raise them up to himself in heaven. And it was just as true back then as it is still today. There is no more polarizing figure than Jesus. This world hates him because of what he said and stood for. We human beings, we sinful humans, either want him to leave us alone entirely in our sins or or we want to think that we can get ourselves out of our sins. Well, the reason Jesus came into this world was to skewer both of those attitudes because we can never possibly have peace and righteousness before a holy God like that. If we are already imperfect, then we can never possibly make ourselves perfect again or ever properly stand before a perfect God. We deserve punishment for our sins. And what an offensive thought that is to our sinful natures. I mean, we who are mostly good people who tend usually to do the right things and say the right things and wouldn't be caught dead doing some of the things that are, that, are, uh, that are popular in society nowadays, doesn't it give us some angst to think that even we deserve to be punished for our sins? Well, you can understand why Simeon said that Jesus would be a sign that will be spoken against. Because we just don't like feeling like we aren't good enough. And, and sometimes we don't like it enough that we even fight back against it. And that's exactly what those Jews did. They spoke against Jesus. They plotted against Jesus. And then they acted against Jesus when they had him arrested and killed. But of course, it was not just them. It was us too because our sinful natures still have those same attitudes that shirk God's control and balk at God's word. We still have those same tendencies to think that we are good enough on our own just as long as we look and sound and seem Christian enough. But that was why it was so important for Jesus to come. That's why he had to come and reveal the thoughts of many hearts so that we could reject those lies of the devil, so that we could know God's truth and so that we could follow our Lord the way he wants. You see, even with all that opposition from this world and even with how mixed up our own hearts and minds can be, none of that stopped Jesus from still completing the work he came to do. His death was not just a tragedy. His death was a purposeful sacrifice that redeemed us from slavery to the devil, that paid for our sins, that, that brought us from spiritual darkness into his wonderful light. The blood that poured out from Jesus' pierced side as, as he hung there lifeless on the cross 
is the blood that cleansed you from every sinful attitude we have ever had and set you apart for his loving care and perfect paradise. Yes, Jesus' death, it was painful to go through and to see it was the sword that even pierced his mother's own soul. But that's what Jesus was willing to do. That's what Jesus had to do in order to reveal his salvation to this world. And so how does that salvation come to you and me? Well, it comes by a sword. It comes by the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And, and Simeon knew that too. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. According to your word is what the text actually says there. And isn't that little phrase just packed with significance. He knew, Simeon knew God's promises from the Bible, and he knew that they never fail. Not one thing that our God has promised his people has ever come up empty, and God would surely not leave us wanting or hang us out to dry on his greatest promise of providing salvation for us in Christ. Simeon trusted that the Lord would be faithful to his word because when he speaks, he doesn't lie and he doesn't change his mind and he doesn't make mistakes or errors. Therefore, Simeon had peace, peace of mind, and even better, peace of heart because he himself had seen the Lord's salvation, seen what he knew the Lord would follow through on. And remember, that's what Jesus' name means. Salvation, Savior. That's who he came to be. It was not a political resurgence, not a conquering army, not a worldwide empire, but a child. That was the greatest fulfillment of all of God's promises to his people. And to Simeon, that meant he was ready to go. Come what may, however the Lord saw fit to let him go on living in this world, he was content. He had seen Jesus. His salvation had arrived, and so he was ready to go home to heaven. What great faith, and what a great example this, this Simeon was. I suppose that's why we still sing his song in our worship services. That's because even though we don't have exactly the same experience that Simeon did holding baby Jesus in our, hand, in our hands, in our arms, we can still have the same word, have the same faith, have the same peace because we behold our Lord Jesus Christ every time we gather here in his house around his word and sacraments. Remember that he promised wherever two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Remember he promised that in holy baptism we are united to him in his life and death and resurrection. Remember that he promised that in holy communion this is my body, this is my blood. By the power of his word, Jesus is here with us, living and working in our hearts to cut through our sinful unbelief and cut away our sinful, stubborn, selfish pride and to give us instead the peace of salvation and to make us his true people and true members of the Israel of God. So you know what that means, don't you? It means that salvation comes by the sword. The sword that pierced Jesus, first of all. And then the sword of the Spirit that opens our hearts to our Savior and everything He did for us. So let's use it. 
Let's use that sword of the Spirit faithfully and regularly. Let's resolve, not just in this new year that's coming, but in every year that our Lord gives to us to be here around God's Word and sacraments often and always more. Because see, this isn't a sword that brings carnage. This is a sword that brings consolation. The kind of consolation that means we can look at all of the carnage going on around in the world around us and we can laugh with Simeon and we can say, Sovereign Lord, you now dismiss your servant in peace for my eyes have seen your salvation. In the sword of God's word and sacraments, we too have seen that salvation. We too have peace for our hearts and minds and souls. And so we too can look forward to seeing our Savior one day face to face and holding him in our arms just like Simeon when we meet his warm embrace in heaven. God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's continue now to sing together the song of Mary. It's found printed beginning on page 9 in your service folder. <laughs> may be seated. Let's continue now by bringing our thank offerings to our Lord. I ask that while the offerings are being collected, please sign the friendship registers located at the ends of your pews. Thank you.
Please stand. Let's continue now with the prayer of the church, which is printed for you on page 11 in your service folder. O oh, gracious and almighty Father, we praise you that you kept your ancient promises by sending your everlasting Son in human flesh. Receive our thanks and devotion, our songs and prayers. You sent Jesus as a lowly child to demonstrate your concern for all, the weak and lowly, the troubled and frightened, the timid and helpless. No one is overlooked by your ever-seeking eyes. No one is excluded from your upholding arms. No one is denied the comfort and help of your outstretched hand. Bless us with a childlike faith in the divine assurance that you love and care for us always. You sent Jesus as the Savior of the world to deliver all from the curse of sin, the power of death, and the torment of hell. He took our place. He was born under the law to set us free. He became the innocent lamb of sacrifice. He came to die and rise again in order that we might live eternally. Firmly implant this good news in our hearts and fill us with an eager desire to spread the word concerning what we have heard tonight. May all who hear the message in every nation under heaven be amazed and believe what is told them about the child. You sent Jesus as the light of the world on Christmas night to drive out all darkness that would rob us of the full life that you intend for us. May the joy that will be for all people be our joy. May the peace on earth to all on whom his favor rests be our peace. May the treasure that Mary pondered in her heart be our treasure. For in the town of David, a Savior has been born to us. He is Christ the Lord. Amen. Lord, we also come before you today to praise you for bringing together Kathy Eaker and Leonard Janovic, who made their marriage promises to each other this last Friday. Be the focal point in their marriage. Draw them ever closer together in love and selfless commitment. Give them love that lasts throughout their lives and bind them up always more and more in their mutual faith in you. Lastly, Lord, we also ask you to be with all those among our congregation, family, and friends who are struggling with their health or working through personal difficulties. We especially entrust to your care Jan Winter, who was hospitalized this week with influenza. If it is your will, please give them all quick comfort, healing, and recovery. But in all things, focus their eyes of faith on you so that they can see your good purposes in this life and look forward to their perfect life eternal. We pray all these things in your name, trusting that you will hear and answer us. And we also join in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may be seated. Let's continue now with our closing hymn. It's hymn number 577, Rise, O Light of Gentile Nations. <laughs> 